is Pat O'Brien. Pat graduated from the University of Chicago. She currently is the Ernst & Young Professor of Accounting at the University of Waterloo. Um, thank you very much uh, for that nice introduction, and thank you, Peter, for inviting me to the conference. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, thank you, Mark, for providing such an easy target. Actually, Greg Miller told me to say that, and he said he'd buy me dinner if I, I did. And Greg, I'm very happy to see that you did bring a second shirt so that you could change the one you were wearing yesterday. Um, since Peter's identified me as the great, one of the gray eminences here, I, I guess that what I have to do is take you back to the period of time when large reptiles ro roamed the uh, North American continent, and, and, and Peter actually had a full head of hair. Um, when we started, as, as uh, Mark pointed out, what we were trying to do is model expected earnings and thinking about analysts might provide a, uh, a good model. Uh, Mark really reviewed that pretty well. So I want to talk about a different antecedent of that early literature, and that was what we were doing with the forecast or how we were evaluating them, and in, in a disappointing sense, how people still are evaluating forecasts was pretty much based on the economic forecasting literature. The uh, literature, for example, that uses the NBER surveys of economic forecasts by uh, economists. Mark alluded to some uh, evidence that's based on that kind of data. The quarterly forecasts produced in a, in a regular survey uh, format that we'd then evaluate the quality. These are the people that, for example, have predicted nine of the last five rece recessions and so forth. Um, the criteria that we use, or that, that the economics literature was using, are largely statistical. Are the forecasts biased in expectations, the error zero? Are they accurate relative to a squared error or an absolute error loss function? Are they efficient? One manifestation of that is do you learn from your errors? Are your errors uh, uncorrelated or correlated through time. Um, these criteria have themselves some embedded assumptions, and there's some important embedded assumptions, especially when we move to the realm of analyst forecasts. First, that these errors that we're evaluating come from a single stable distribution. In other words, you're forecasting pretty much the same thing over and over again, and so you really do have new draws from the same distribution. That they're independent draws, that every error that we observe is independent of every other one, and so we're kept pulling them out of this. And that they're representative of the population that we want to study, uh, the population of mistakes or whatever, however you want to um, describe this. The... Uh, Criticisms of those assumptions are many, and they include some of the data issues that Mark was talking about, like that there, there might be differences in the processes. These are you know, well-known. We, we, different firms might require different scale variables. That's not what I want to focus on, because I'd like to focus on analysts and their behavior. Um, I think the analyst literature has brought some insights to that economic forecasting literature. Uh, those insights about how analysts behave and what they do uh, ought to then feed back into, you know, what we think about are the right criteria to use if we were in the business of evaluating their forecasts. Um, the first and, and really important and, and fundamental one is that analysts are adaptive. They're adaptive to the fact that the company may not be doing the same thing year in, year out. It might change its operations, might merge with other companies. Um, to economic shocks that change the process that the, the exogenous uh, influences on what happens it, with the uh, company's earnings. Um, but importantly, another adaptation that analysts are capable of making is they're able to look at one another. They're able to look at the forecasts that each other are producing and adapt to those. When we think about that, that's, that's got really profound implications for how we use the forecasts. Another uh, feature or insight into their behavior is that they are selective. They don't report for every company in the world. We don't have analyst data on every company, and it's not a random sample, the companies for whom we do have analyst forecasts. 
Um, they also, within the companies that they report on, they make decisions about when they're going to report and uh, whether they may omit a report at a, a particular periods of time. All of this is um, getting to the point of saying, well, they're, they're strategic. You know, they are, uh, they have these motives. These motives that Mark uh, discussed in his talk um, really were identified pretty early in the literature when people thought they were um, observing persistent and pervasive optimism. Well, why? Why would that happen? And so they came up with various scenarios. Um, but getting back to what happens to those criteria, if they're adaptive, if they are responding to one another's forecasts, if they're looking at what the last bunch of analysts said about the company before they produce their own, then their forecast errors cannot be independent. Uh, they aren't from an identical process. The first analyst with a given piece of information is a different process from analysts who come along later and mimic that person. Um, their selective means that the group of forecasts that we observe in our data sets aren't representative. They're not representative of the population of analyst opinions about all firms. We don't see analyst opinions about all firms. And I think it is you know, useful to keep that in mind, that we don't have a representative sample. Um, and again, the strategic business that um, means simply that the analysts have an agenda. The earnings forecasts may actually be some way of getting advancing that agenda. And so to conceive of their forecasts as having or wanting their forecasts to have some optimal properties of um, unbiasedness, for example, or a lack of serial correlation is, I think, asking something that isn't kind of the right question. Um, Okay, let me just uh, move on. I think um, in recent years we've seen research that looks at uh, other criteria and in many respects more context appropriate criteria and criteria that are more relevant to the theme of this, this conference. Um, are the forecasts useful in valuation? Well, yes, they turn out to be somewhat useful in valuation. Uh, can the forecasts and, and a suitable valuation model, and we'll have to leave that for other sessions, identify when a security is mispriced? Uh, can the disagreement in analyst forecasts tell us something about uncertainty that may, in fact, uh, get at that troublesome cost of capital uh, variable? I think that um, you know, these criteria are um, more appropriate evaluators of the context, but what we have is actually the same breakdown in inferences based on uh, analysts' strategic behavior. Because if they're adaptive, if they're selective, if they're strategic, then the quality of their forecasts, the range of their forecasts, the numbers of firms for whom we have forecasts are all going to uh, be affected by that adaptive and strategic behavior. So I think that what we might miss is opportunities. If we're not keeping that in the back of our minds, if we're actually just saying, okay, well, I got this great data set, you know, and it's got all these forecasts, and gee, they seem to be accurate, and so let me go ahead and use them. We're missing opportunities like, um, well, for what companies do I not have forecasts, and do the valuation models work for those? And do they work the same way? Or could they, in principle, actually work somewhat differently for companies that don't get analysts' coverage? Uh, and can I generalize from the observations that I see to those that I wish that I could see but don't? Um, I think that those are important and interesting things. Um, I had to struggle a little bit because, you know, it's not really where my mind is focused these days to get back and try and come up with some questions that are more relevant to the theme of the conference, but I did try to do that. I think that along these lines, we do need to un know whether analysts understand and use accounting 
whether they need to understand and use accounting to do what they do, uh, because really our valuation models typically do uh, s s um, depend on an understanding of the uh, financial statements. We'd like to know what they use, what they don't use, but in a real sense of, of what goes into their decisions, um, I think it's very important to know whether they're just repackaging the stuff that management has said, which I think, you know, there, there's certainly some evidence that that is what they're doing. Or do, are, they, are they creating new information? You know, is this uh, just a repackaging or is it actually information production? Um, and then when I say, and does accounting influence their real decisions, uh, I mean not their forecasting decisions, but rather their selections of companies that they're going to choose to report about, their recommendations about those companies and the, um, uh, the stock selections and the stock reports that they write about those companies. So let me conclude. I do think that analysts play an interesting role. They probably produce and at least distribute information in the capital market. I think that we've established that in, uh, in research. I think that importantly, we have gained a lot of information about how their behavior and, uh, and their incentives affect what information they produce and what they disseminate. Um, maybe, cynically, earnings forecast isn't the most interesting thing they do. Maybe there are more interesting things they do, but I think that it has provided us with a lot of these insights that, uh, that we work off of now. So, thank you. Thank you, Pat.